right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, hello and welcome to um, the Barton Associates Locum Tenens Tax Webinar. Um, we're really excited that you all could take some time out of your busy days to join us to learn more from Andrew about, um, you know, doing taxes as a locum. Um, we've done this tax webinar a few times over the last couple of years, but um, we have updated it. So um, sit back, relax, um, and enjoy. And this will be recorded and we will be sending out to all of you um, early next week after we've, you know, cut out a little bit of the chit chat from the beginning. So um, Andrew, I will pass it over to you. Uh, hello. I'd like to thank everybody for taking time out of their busy schedule to attend today's webinar. Uh, my name is Andrew Schwartz. I'm partners with my brother, Rick Schwartz, and the CPA firm, Schwartz & Schwartz. We're based uh, right north of Boston in a town called Woburn, Massachusetts. Uh, each winter, and we're getting right into that, that season, each winter we prepare uh, just over 2,000 personal tax returns. About 90% of those are for physicians, dentists, and psychologists. Um, the rest of the year, April 16th through January 31st, we work with about 300 one and two owner medical and dental practices. Uh, most of those, about 250 are dental practices, the other 50 are medical practices in a variety of specialties. So we're very familiar with the issues affecting you and your colleagues. So let's get right into it. And um, let's talk about uh, things that, that are gonna affect you guys uh, in the near future. So here's what we're gonna cover today. We're gonna start by talking about PPP loans. Uh, that's new this year, obviously, because uh, it's new this year. Uh, it's complicated, but it's a good opportunity for people whose revenue has declined due to uh, the corona pan pandemic. Then we're going to talk about common deductions that uh, people in your situation uh, can deduct. We'll talk about retirement accounts, which are very important to understand and to maximize as best you can during your working years. Uh, health savings accounts are great. It's pretty much the only account I know of where you can make tax deductible contributions that grow uh, tax deferred, you can take the money out tax-free, but we'll get to that. We'll talk about paying your taxes. We'll talk about the new QBI rules, which are probably going to be short-lived uh, now that Trump um, is out of office and Biden's in office, but we'll see. And we'll just talk about some other planning tips. And the goal is to go over all this information and have it wrapped up by five o'clock. Um, okay, so let's get right into it. So PPP loans. So, um, you know, this is not news to anybody. Um, uh, the, I just remember the, the, the timing of everything because, because I was supposed to be going to a, um, a Boston Celtics basketball game on March 13th, Friday the 13th, and Friday the 11th. Uh, I mean, Wednesday the 11th, they canceled the season. So uh, that's kind of where this whole thing, where, where my mind starts. Remember when things uh, got out of control. Within a couple of weeks, they did, Congress did pass the stimulus pra uh, package, the first $2, million, $2 trillion package. And it included uh, the, the PPP loans. And I don't know whether uh, you guys were in a situation to take advantage of the PPP loan or not, but um, it was fairly simple to apply. There was, a, there was a, a, a batch of money set aside for the PPP. They went through that very quickly. They, they set aside more money that they didn't go through. Um, but essentially, if you had your own business, whether you were self-employed or paid yourself as a W-2 employee, and you earned at least $100,000 during 2019, you would have been eligible for a PPP loan of $20,833. Now, uh, for most of the year, we thought that the, the, the loan forgiveness wouldn't be taxable. Uh, they said that right off the bat, but then the IRS came out with their rulings and, the, and three times they issued a ruling saying, uh, we understand that the PPP loan that's forgiven will not be taxable, however, any expenses paid with the PPP loan that is forgiven aren't deductible. And then on December 27th, um, Trump passed his other stimulus uh, package into law and reversed what the IRS was saying. So anybody who got a PPP loan last year, uh, as long as you paid yourself $20,833, which you would have done most likely, um, the loan will be forgiven. The portion of the loan that's forgiven will not be taxable and the expenses that you paid with the PPP loan, um, if you paid your own salary, your salary is still deductible. Um, if you're self-employed, then there really isn't any salary to deduct, so it doesn't really impact anything in that situation, except the 20,000 isn't taxable. Um, when you got the money, you had 10 weeks. I mean, you had originally eight weeks to spend the money. They extended it. You had 24 weeks from the time you got the, 
the PPP loan uh, to spend the money on qualifying expenses. So, so what they do on December 27th, uh, they enacted PPP2, so round two is available. Now this one, uh, there is a certain threshold that you need to meet to be able to apply for the second PPP loan. And you need to be able to demonstrate that either for, for the second quarter, the third quarter or the fourth quarter of 2020, your revenue, the money you earned or collected that quarter was 25% lower, 25% less than the money you collected or earned um, during the same quarter of 2019, right? So I don't know, let's, let's make it easy. Let's say that for 2019, every month, I mean, every quarter, uh, your collections were $100,000. So you, you, you made $400,000 during the course of the year. If in quarter two, your collections were less than $75,000, um, that would mean that you had a decrease in your, in your revenue by 25% or more. And that would, that would make you eligible to apply for round two of the PPP loan. Um, you would base the PPP loan application on either your 2019 or 2020 salaries, assuming you made more than, than, than $100,000 uh, each year, then it's going to be capped at the same $20,833. And the deadline to, to apply for uh, the second round of the PPP is March 31st. Okay, the easiest thing to do is to go with the lender who helped you with the first round of the PPP. But um, if you didn't, if, if that lender didn't do a good job or, or whatever reason you don't want to go back to the lender, I think a lot of our clients, they, they had a very easy time with some of the online banks and PayPal actually was, was one place where, where people went and they made it so easy for people to apply for round one of the PPP. I assume that it's easy again. And from their perspective, it makes a lot of sense because they're, they're going and they're getting paid 5% of the, of the loans that you're getting. And they set up a nice, easy to use website and they must just be printing money over there. Okay, so you can try PayPal. There's some other online ones that make it pretty easy uh, if your bank is giving you a hard time. And just like uh, the rules for PPP round one, this money will be should be fully forgiven, uh, not taxable when it's forgiven and the expenses paid with the PPP would be deductible if they would otherwise be deductible. All right, so, uh, and we have an update on our uh, firm website uh, right here um, if you um, wanna learn more. We actually have a lot of information on our website. We, we put out a lot of info um, as all this was unfolding. Okay, uh, that's the extent of the CARES Act uh, things I'm gonna talk about here. Um, now we're gonna just talk about the, the normal deductions that you're eligible to claim and save some taxes. Okay, so when you, um, when you work at the locums and you're paid as a 1099 um, instead of as a W-2 employee, uh, you get paid a straight amount of money uh, every time you get paid, I don't know if it's bi-weekly or monthly, whatever they do over there. Um, when you get paid that way, you have the opportunity to deduct expenses directly against that income and you're only taxed on the net amount. So let's say you 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 took an assignment, you made $100,000 as a 1099 contractor from that assignment. And we're going to go through a bunch of expenses to claim. Let's say you came up with $20,000 worth of expenses to write off against that income. Uh, in that case, even though you're going to get a 1099 form showing $100,000 of income, you're only going to be taxed on $80,000 after deducting your expenses. So common expenses include health insurance. Now, health insurance is deductible, but it's actually not deductible directly against the income. It's deductible a little bit different way. Um, but your travel, lodging, and your meals, your automobile expenses, education, licenses, and examinations are all deductible. And we are going to talk about one other thing that's new for this year. And that's this section 139 reimbursement that it actually came about after September 11th, but it applied during the pandemic as well. So we'll go over those rules and we're gonna take a closer look at each of these right now. Oh, before we get to that, uh, that first sentence is very important. Uh, for an expense to be deductible for anybody, the expense needs to be both ordinary and necessary uh, in connection with your profession. So. It can't be extravagant and it can't be something that only you need. Okay, health insurance, very important. Um, 
So basically, if you don't have access to health insurance anywhere else, if you if you if you don't get it through a working spouse, or maybe you have a part time job that gives you uh, access to health insurance, if you if you don't have access to health insurance, then if you have uh, locum tenants income uh, that doesn't pay you as a W two that just pays you direct, you're allowed to write off the full amount of your health insurance um, on your tax return. So if you're if you, you set up a corporation for your locums, which frankly, I don't really recommend, um, and I will go over that later. If you set up a corporation, you would deduct your health insurance um, as a deduction on your corporate tax return. If you are self-employed, if you set up an LLC that hasn't elected to be treated as an S corporation, then there's a place on your personal tax return to deduct the health insurance. But the key thing is the health insurance premiums that you pay, um, as long as you're not eligible for any other health insurance, it's fully deductible. If you're over the age of 65 and you're getting Medicare, the Medicare premiums that you pay through your social security also counts as a self-employed health insurance. So that's something you're not gonna have a check. You're not gonna see, it's, it's not gonna be easy to, to, to you know, keep track of that, except when you get your social security statement, uh, it is gonna show the amount of Medicare and prescription prescription drug premiums that you paid in connection with getting your social security. Okay. But don't forget that one. If you're doing some locums and you're over the age of 65, uh, it'll save you some taxes. All right. Travel, lodging and meals. I don't even know how relevant this is right now. I guess it'll get more relevant soon with the vaccine. Hopefully the vaccine will work perfectly and, and things will start returning to normal where you can actually go out to dinner and sit inside a restaurant and not be concerned about the uh, ramifications. But assuming we're gonna get back to that world where, um, where you actually travel uh, to places and eat at a restaurant, let's talk about how that works. So if, if you're involved in a locum tenens assignment, um, if you take on an assignment that's outside of the general vicinity of where you, li where you live, so it's far enough away that you can't just drive there, work for the day and drive home. It's so far that if you drive there and work for the day, you need to rest before you come home. That's kind of the rule of thumb. So if you work somewhere that's outside the general vicinity of where you live, um, you can deduct 100% of your travel expenses, 100% of your lodging, and then 50% of your meals, which starting next year will be 100% deductible again. So um, flying back and back and forth, renting an apartment, the utilities that you would pay, that would count as travel, uh, meals, the meals that you, that, that you need to eat while you're outside of the general vicinity of your home, all that stuff counts and all that stuff is deductible directly against your locum tenants income. So um, for the travel and for the lodging, that is based on the actual expenses incurred and um, uh, so you want to keep track of it. And the one way to keep track of it is you, you just use one credit card for all your business related expenses. At the end of the year, you go and you get a, um, hopefully you have a credit card that gives you a nice year end statement that, that summarizes all your expenses. And, and as long as you don't commingle personal expenses with business expenses, it makes it nice and easy to claim the deduction. For meals, um, meals are either based on the actual cost of the meals incurred or they're based on this thing called the per diem rates, uh, right? The per diem rates. So that's a daily rate um, based on each metropolitan area. You can easily access the per diem rates by going to gsa.gov. Let's see if this works. Uh, it's probably gonna go to my other screen. Okay, gsa.gov. And uh, I, I was here the other day, uh, real quick. I thought someone that was per diem rates was up here. How, oh, per diem lookup, you just go here. And um, you pick a state. Let's see what Boston is these days. Uh, I would just go next. Okay. So basically, Boston, where's the food? This, all right. It's, I guess, $96 a day. That seems high. Oh, wait. We just want, we just want this. Sorry. All right. Here's the, the rate. So in Boston, it's $71 a day. So if you're going to go and you're going to spend two months in Boston, you get to go and take a deduction without having any receipts of $71 a day. Okay. 
So it uh, makes it nice and easy. The rule here is you need to be consistent by trip. So if you go on one trip and you're spending a lot of money on food, you can base it on the actual cost of all your food. If you go on a second trip and you, you're pretty frugal, uh, you can base it if you go to Boston on the $71 a day or whatever the per diem rates are for the city where you go. Very easy. And then there's a place where you can look up foreign travel as well. Okay, so that's travel, lodging, and meals. Uh, next, we have automobile expenses. So these rules are very straightforward. Basically, um, commuting between your home and a regular place of business is not deductible. What is deductible is driving between job sites, driving between your home and a temporary job site, where a temporary job site is a, is a job assignment that you have for less than a year, um, and then traveling to interviews, conferences, things like that. So all that driving around counts. Um, and uh, yeah, so for most people, the assignments would last for less than a year. So anytime you drive to your locum's assignment, that mileage is deductible. There's two ways you can calculate automobile expenses. One is based on the standard mileage rate. And for 2020, it's 57 and a half cents a mile. And for 2021, it went down to 56 cents a mile. Uh, you would have think you would have thought with with how much gas prices declined with this whole craziness that the per diem rate would have gone down by more, but they didn't. Uh, wasn't that crazy when 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 oil a barrel of oil was was a negative price because it was more expensive to store it than you could sell it for? Or they had ugh, everything was just so crazy, boy. Okay, so um, the um, so all you have to do here is you tally up your business expenses. Uh, your business mileage for the year, very easy to do. You know, how far did you drive? How many times did you drive there? And multiply it by the applicable per diem rate. Or if you drive very few miles during the year, and most of those miles are business miles, uh, you might be better off basing your deduction on the actual expenses incurred. And uh, the actual expenses includes gas, insurance, repairs, parking at home. So if you live in a city and pay for parking for, you, for your car, that counts and lease payments if you lease your car or a, 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 um, a factor for depreciation where you just get to claim a deduction based on the cost of the car if you own the car. So if you drive very few miles and most of your, your miles are business miles, uh, let's say you drive 3,000 miles during the year and you, you figure out that 2,000 miles were spent driving back and forth to a locum's position, you get to claim two thirds of your expenses, which is gonna be a much higher amount than the 2,000 miles that you drove versus 57 and a half cents a mile, okay? So, uh, but automobile expenses should be something that you should be writing off against your income. Then we have education, uh, licenses and examinations. Um, so anytime you do something that qualifies you for a new trade of business, those expenses aren't deductible and that's medical school, dental school, law school, college, all those things. Um, Anytime you do something that, that improves your skills in your current trade or business, uh, that is tax deductible. Um, and so that includes, once you, once you pass your initial license, licensing for, for medicine, if you need to take any, any licensing exams to recertify, that's all deductible. If you need to take licensing exams in other states, that's all deductible. Um, so examinations counts. All the fees to get licensed in the different states, that's all deductible once you have your initial license. Um, in education, you know, if you're involved in, 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 in MPH or if you're taking classes to improve your skills, maybe you're taking foreign language classes and, and you're living in, and you're working in underserved areas, all that stuff that in, improves your skills in your current trade or business, it, it improves your skills to practice medicine or to work as a locums. Um, that generally is tax deductible. And don't forget, you're doing this for your company. So there's some, some leeway to you decide what expenses you're going to let yourself pay for to improve your skills. Okay, but it's very important um, they keep track of, uh, keep good records here. Um, if you do get audited, the IRS is going to look for some information about the course you took and that you completed it and you got some type of, of certificate of completion or something like that. All right, so... Um, but yeah, education licenses and examinations, if anybody is um, in mental health, um, all the costs of, um, if you're in psychoanalysis, uh, um, a psychoanalyst 
who is in psychoanalysis as part of their training or to improve their skills, that's all deductible. If anybody out there is a dentist who's involved in a specialty program, the specialty program is deductible because for dentists that improves their skills to work as a dentist, an orthodontist is seen as, as, as a dentist who does, who specializes in orthodontist. The orthodontics, they're not seen as a whole nother, uh, a, a whole nother profession. All right, so this is the one that was um, new uh, this year. Um, so this is an interesting one. So as I said earlier, this came up after September 11th. Um, and basically what they said was um, when there's a national emergency, all of a sudden people have to incur a lot more expenses to be able just to do their job, to be able to get through the day and do their job. And if you, if, if you're working somewhere or if you have your own business, the, the business can reimburse the uh, individual for, for these costs. Um, and the business gets a deduction for the cost that they reimburse the, the person, the employee for, and the uh, employee doesn't need to pay taxes. That's not seen as taxable income. Okay, so deductible to, the, to, to your practice, not taxable to you or any other employees that you have. If you do have other employees, which most likely isn't the case, this is one employee benefit that you are able to discriminate against people. So you can you can provide a 139 benefit to some people, but not to uh, not to everybody. So usually, if you do something for one person, one full time employee, you need to do it for everybody. But this one you don't have to. So, um, but the issue is what like what expenses qualify for the 139 deduction that you're already not writing off if you have your own little business where you're, where you're doing locums and you're getting a 1099 and you're trying to figure out what, what expenses to write off against that income anyhow. So, uh, but the things that, that would count for the 139 deduction. Uh, so if you, if, if all of a sudden, instead of going to the hospital, you, you're doing telemedicine or you're working from home or you're spending more time working from home, I would say any expenses that you incur during the year to improve your working situation uh, your working environment at your house, uh, I would think that would count. So if you had to get some some furniture, if you had to improve the technology, the broadband at the house, if you had to buy more new computer equipment, phones, you know, uh, iPads, any of that stuff, um, I would say any of the money you spent on things like that that enabled you to work um, in under the current situation that you didn't need before would all be deductible. And also if you have kids and all of a sudden your kids who are going to school every day are at home every day and you need to figure out like what you can do uh, for, you, for care of your kids so you can continue to work and, 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 um, and earn a living, those expenses over and above what you're already paying would count. So if you had one of these situations where you and your neighbors got together and you hired your own teacher to, to, to tutor the kids after school because they weren't because the schools were having trouble, you know, teaching the kids based on the same, based on pre-pandemic ways. Um, and that, and by hiring a teacher that allowed you to continue to work, that would count <clears throat> tutoring. If you had um, additional childcare, which allowed you to work over and above what you were already paying, all that stuff would count for the 139 deduction. So if, if you're listening to this and you think that you had some expenses um, since March, 15th or whenever this whole thing started that qualify under this 139 deduction. Um, it's not too late to take advantage of it. You don't, you know, you're not like General Motors with a, with a, with a very precise set of books. Um, just tally up the amount of 139 expenses that you feel that you, you incurred during 2020 that you want to take a tax break for. Uh, and just whoever does your taxes, just have them pick up those additional expenses in addition to whatever showed up on your credit card statement for the year and whatever went through your bank account. Uh, this is stuff that that is not will not be found by the checks that you wrote through the through the practice or on your credit card. This is these are expenses that are outside of all that. So just let the tax guy know, a tax woman, um, that you you know you heard about one thirty nine and you're all over it and and here's the amount you want to deduct. Uh, we had actually a lot of our clients. Um, who have staff, they use this 139 as a way to give their, their staff bonuses without having to put it through payroll. It was, it was pretty nifty. Uh, there was a lot written about it. We do have something on our blog 
um, that talks about the 139. And in, in, in this article, it's tough to really figure out what counted. Um, but there's, there's links to two different articles. One by, um, one is a Forbes article. I, I don't remember what the other one is. It's either ADA or AMA. Um, and it's really good. So uh, if you are, if you like reading and learning this stuff and you want to save some taxes, I suggest um, clicking on this link and seeing what, what those articles have to say. Okay, retirement accounts. Uh, very, very important. Anybody who is close to retirement or has retired, uh, well, I guess if you're at the seminar, you would not have retired yet. Anybody who's close to retirement can attest to how important it is to start saving early, save as much as you can, and, um, and invest the money prudently. Okay, but let's talk about why. So, um, uh, so anybody who is working, um, contributing to a retirement plan during your working years is pretty much the best tax shelter available to you. And let's talk about why. So let's say that um, you're in the 28% federal tax bracket and anybody who knows tax brackets knows that there is no longer 28% tax bracket. But for this example, let's say that there is. So let's say that you're in the 28% federal tax bracket and you live in a state with a 5% tax like Massachusetts, um, each additional dollar that you earn is taxed at 33%. Okay, so that makes sense. So when you're in a tax bracket, that's the rate for each additional dollar. So if you set up a retirement plan and you don't go with the Roth version, uh, you go with the one where you get a tax deduction up front and the money grows tax deferred and you pay taxes later, um, you save $330 on every thousand dollars that you put into your retirement account, right? You're in a 33% marginal tax bracket. The thousand dollars is tax deductible. You, you, you put in a thousand, the government gives you back 330. So it only costs you $670 to have a thousand dollars growing tax deferred in your retirement account. So, uh, so instead of taking a thousand dollars as salary or, or compensation and paying taxes on it, you put the thousand dollars into the retirement account. You save three hundred thirty dollars in taxes. It costs you six hundred seventy dollars to have a thousand dollars growing tax deferred in your retirement account. You've already earned a forty four percent return on your money. It only costs you six hundred seventy dollars to have a thousand dollars growing tax deferred in your retirement account. So yes, you do pay taxes on that money when you take it out later, but one of the values, one of the most valuable parts about putting money into a retirement account is, is the tax deferred compounded growth on the government's money. So that $330 that went into your, into your retirement account that didn't go to the government as taxes, you invest the $330 and you keep the compounded earnings off that money for as long as the money stays invested in the retirement account. And, and, and the compounded tax deferred growth is, is it, you can't beat it. There's nothing you can do. Uh, there's, uh, there's not much you can do to get a better rate of return than, than this tax deferred growth and by investing the government's money. Okay, so this year, I'll go over the maximums in a minute, but obviously it's much more than $1,000. So the amount of taxes you're not paying by putting away the maximum into your retirement account every year, that tax savings, you invest, you keep the earnings, and, and that's how you're able to, to, to retire with, with a big enough nest egg, a large enough nest egg to hopefully retire comfortably, okay? So yes, you'll be taxed on the road, but you keep the compounded earnings. Uh, and the popular options are SEP IRAs, simple IRAs, and solo 401ks. There's, there's another option. If you, um, if, if you weren't able to save much for retirement uh, over your working years, maybe, I don't know, you had, you, you, I don't know, there's a million reasons not to save money. There is a way for people uh, near the end of their careers to catch up, and that's with a, what's called a defined benefit plan. With a defined benefit plan, if you make like $150,000 or $200,000 a year, you can put away $150,000 or some crazy amount of money every year pre-tax. So um, the SEPs, the simplest and the solo 401ks are the most common retirement plans we see. People who, who need to catch up, um, they'll look into one of these defined benefit plans and it really helps them put away a lot of money uh, every year. 
Okay, so I actually don't have any more information. All right, so real quick, um, if we have information, there's a link right here. So with a SEP IRA, um, if you're self-employed, you can put away 20% of your net self-employment earnings uh, up to $57,000 this year. If you're, if you're a W-2 employee of your own S corporation, you can put away 25% of your W-2 wages. A simple IRA, you can put away $13,500 plus 3% of your self-employment income or your wages. If you're, um, if you're 50 or over, you can do $16,500 dollars plus 3%. In solo 401ks, you can put away $19,500 plus 20% of your self-employment earnings. If you're 50 or older, you can do, you can put away another 6,500. So if you, let's say you earn $100,000 and you wanna max out your solo 401k, you can put away almost $40,000 pre-tax into a solo 401k on your $100,000 of earnings um, through your locum tenants. So, so you can really save a lot of taxes and build up that all important nest egg by figuring out which is the right retirement plan for you. Um, at this point in time, you can always switch them later, but you wanna, you wanna set up the one that's gonna make the most sense uh, for the most amount of time. All right, how savings counts. I kinda, uh, um, I told you how great these things are and they are great. And as I said, um, I honestly think that it's this is the only place where you can put money where the money goes in that's tax deductible, the money grows tax deferred, and when the money comes out later from your health savings account, the money comes out tax free. Um, to qualify for a health savings account, you need to be covered under a qualifying high deductible health insurance plan. So you know with a with a high deductible health insurance plan, you might have to pay more money out of pocket, but your your health insurance premiums should also go down, uh, the less the health insurance company is going to cover, the less you should pay every month for the premiums. Um, whoever you get your health insurance from can tell you whether or not the, um, the policy you have qualifies you to put away money into a, a health savings account. So, but the way it works is very simple. You have your qualifying high deductible health insurance um, uh, policy in place. You pay your monthly premiums, you pay it through your business account. And as we said earlier, the business is going to write off the premiums um, either as a deduction on a corporate tax return or as an adjustment to income on your personal tax return. Okay, so you pay the premium. Um, then you set up this, this companion account. It's actually, it's an account. It's like, a, it's like a retirement account. It's like a bank account. It's an account with real money. Um, it's not like a flexible spending account, an FSA, where there's a use it or lose it provision. It's, a, um, it's more like an IRA where you put the money away, you can invest it however you want, and the money stays invested for a long period of time. At this point in, point in time, Vanguard offers health savings accounts for you to open up. Fidelity offers HSAs. Schwab offers them. All the, all the financial institutions now offer HSAs. And the strategy that a lot of people who can afford it do is um, they'll get the high deductible health insurance. Um, they'll contribute the maximum to the health savings account, which for 2020, and there's still time to put money away for 2020 up until April 15th, 2021 to, to fund your HSA for 2020 if you are eligible. It was $7,100 for a family plan and $3,550 for an individual. Next year, it's going up to $7,200 and $3,600 is the amount that can go into an HSA. Um, a lot of people who can afford it, they'll put money into the HSA and when it comes time for them to pay their family's healthcare costs, they don't take money out of the HSA. They'll just take it out of their checking account. So anytime you have a health bill to pay, a medical bill or a dental bill to pay, uh, and you have a health savings account, you need to ask yourself, do you want to take the money out of the account, which is, which is probably not even invested? The money's probably sitting in just you know a checking account earning no interest, uh, or it's earning a very little bit of interest. Or do you want to take this money out of this great, beautiful account that's growing tax deferred and the money can come out tax free later that's invested in mutual funds through Vanguard or Fidelity or through Schwab? Uh, and assuming there's money in your household account to pay, the, to pay the, the healthcare bill, you take the money out of there, you leave the money in the HSA. The next year, you add more money to the HSA. It's just another place for money to grow in a tax advantaged account. And um, 
as you can see, I really think HSAs are great. They came out a while ago at this point, but um, at first it, it, it took a while to, for them to get traction. They're very popular now and they make a lot of sense, especially for somebody who's self-employed, who's paying their own health insurance and, uh, and who, who between them and their family, uh, everybody's reasonably healthy. Okay, HSAs. All right, so let's, uh, so what happens if you are um, paid as locum tenants? So somehow or another, you need to get your taxes paid in, right? And um, if you work for somebody as a W-2 employee, then the taxes would be paid in through your withholding, right? Uh, you work somewhere, you get paid your salary, they withhold taxes based on how you figure, fill out the W-4 form. At the end of the year, you see how close you came. Maybe you get a refund, maybe you owe some money, who knows? If, 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 you, um, if you're a locum and you, um, you set up an LLC or you're working as a sole proprietor and you elected to be tra treated as an S corporation, which would only apply to an LLC, you would still put yourself on, on W-2 salary and you would withhold taxes for the most part. So that's not too bad. But if you're a locums and you did not make the election for, for, to be treated as an S corporation, and I still got to talk about why I don't like that. And I'll get to that pretty soon. Um, then you have to pay your own taxes. And um, it's easy to do. It's a form 1040 ES. Uh, so once a, four times during the year, uh, based on what, what seems like random dates, because they switch the dates around when they try to balance the budget a few times. But uh, the first quarter estimate is, is due April 15th. The second quarter estimate is due June 15th. The third quarter estimate is due September 15th. And the fourth quarter estimates due, is due January 15th of the following year. Um, you figure out how much you should be paying in based on either your last year's tax or you do some quick calculations uh, and you send in the money to, uh, to the federal government for your estimates. It's not that tough. In years where your income is increasing, you can base your estimates on, the last, on your last year's tax. Um, if you owe a lot of money, there's a penalty where as long as your tax is paid in, during the year exceed 110% of your prior year's tax, you won't be penalized no matter how much you earn. Um, in years that, you're, you're, that your income is decreasing, you actually wanna calculate what to pay each quarter because you don't want the government to hold all that extra money. Um, for states, the rules are uh, as follows. If you, all right, so you first pay taxes to the state where you work. So, uh, as long as, so if you work in a state that has a state income tax, uh, you're required to, to pay quarterly estimates to that tax first, okay? And so you figure out the state tax rate and once a quarter, based on what you earned the, the prior, dur during the quarter, you just send in the taxes. You then pay taxes, then you then need to calculate the taxes on the state where you live and the taxes you pay to the state where you work offset the taxes to the state where you live. So, so um, uh, and, and to take it a step further, so what happens is you end up paying taxes combined based on the higher, based on the state with the higher tax rate. Okay, so here, if I if you live in Massachusetts, the rate is 5%. The rate in Rhode Island, I think, I don't know, let's say it's 7%. So if you live in Mass and you work in Rhode Island, um, you would pay 7% taxes on the income you earn in Rhode Island to Rhode Island, and then, and then when you do your Massachusetts return, you would calculate the mass tax at 5%. Since the tax paid to Rhode Island is higher than the mass tax, uh, you would not owe any mass income taxes on, the, um, on, on that income because it was Rhode Island taxes are higher. So you end up paying the Rhode Island tax rate. What happens if you live in Rhode Island and work in Massachusetts? So there you first pay taxes to Massachusetts at 5%. Then you, you calculate the tax on, on, your, on all your income to Rhode Island, including the locum's income and that's taxed at, let's say, 7%, you take a credit for the 5% you paid to Mass against the 7% for Rhode Island, so you, you end up paying Rhode Island 2% uh, based on the income you earn. So either way, they get 7%. One way, Rhode Island got all 7%. The other way, Mass got 5%, and Rhode Island got 2%. But same thing, you need to um, set in quarterly estimates. When you're new to a state, there is no prior year exception to avoid being penalized. So when you're working at a, a state that you didn't work the prior year, actually anytime you're working at a state besides your home state, you really wanna pay estimates every quarter as you earn the income. 
All right, so this is the third year for the QBI deduction. This is uh, what Trump came up with. And then, as I said, I have a feeling that this might be the last year for this thing. This was a good deal. Uh, this really saved a lot of, of, of small business owners, a lot of, of, of healthcare professionals who, who weren't in the fields where they made a ton of money. It really helped save a lot of taxes. So basically, um, it's a 20% deduction based on the amount of income that you report. Uh, so let's say you did some locums work, you made 120,000, you came up with $20,000 of expenses. So the net amount you made was 100,000. If you don't have a lot of other income going on, on your tax return, you're gonna pick up this $20,000 deduction. And if you're in the, you know, the tax rates I said, you apply the tax rates and you, you, you save five, six, $7,000 worth of taxes. So the QBI deduction, it applies whether you're a sole proprietor, whether you work through a partnership, um, if you have an S corporation, it applies, except it doesn't apply for the money that you take as a W-2 salary. It applies to the S corp profit and limited liability companies. Um, it applies, you know, but if you make the S election, it doesn't apply. There is a phase out. And if you're in a field such as medicine or dental, um, the phase out, if your income exceeds the phase out, then you don't get any of the QBI deduction based on, on this income, but it's, it's reasonably high for a married couple. It phases out at, at 326. Uh, for a single individual, it's completely phased out at 163. Um, most programs calculate it automatically, but it's just for, for business owners and you guys who are doing locums are all business owners. Uh, it is a great way uh, to save some taxes. Uh, so I, let me take this opportunity because I don't know if I'm going to, I don't I remember the slides I put together, whether I have a slide on this. Why I think that S-Corps are tough for people who do locum tenants. So if you work as a locum and you work basically in your home state, then the S corporation might make more sense. Um, but if you if you have an S corporation and you want to do it right, and you're going to work in multiple states, first off, anytime you work in a state besides the state where the, where the S corporation is registered, it's my understanding that you need to register to do business in all these other states. So that's a pain in the neck. And then... Uh, S corporations are required to pay their, their employees a reasonable salary. So if you live in one state and you go to another state, first you have to register to even work in that state. And then you have to go and um, you have to set up to, to, to withhold the, 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 that state's income taxes. You need to sign up to do unemployment taxes in that state. It just seems like it's going to be an administrative nightmare. And we actually feel that for somebody... Who, do, who otherwise would have no employees, if they're not gonna make more than $350,000 net after expenses, um, I, I feel that, th that that person would be better off not incorporating because there, there's a lot of fees and headaches associated with setting up a corporation that you don't get the benefits from to, to repay yourself and to, to make it worthwhile until your income exceeds $350,000. So if you go, and you set up an S corporation, um, uh, how do you save taxes? The, the biggest way is, is if you're self-employed, you owe social security taxes on the first 140,000 you make, and you owe Medicare taxes on all the additional income you earn. And if you earn more than 200, 200 or $250,000, the Medicare tax rate is 3.8%. If you're an S corporation, you can take money out of, the, of your S corporation as salary, or you can take it out as S corp distributions and the S corp distributions save you 3.8% on, on the amount of money you take. So if you take $100,000 in S corp distributions, you save $3,800 in taxes. So you really have to you know, be able to take a lot of S corp distributions to pay yourself back for all these additional costs you're gonna have. So all of a sudden you have to deal with payroll, you have to put yourself on payroll, you have to have file a corporate tax return, have pay an accountant to do that. Most states have a minimum tax for corporations, uh, which you have to pay. There's payroll taxes that sole proprietors don't pay that you have to pay. So even if you're able to take $100,000 of S Corp distributions, that $3,800 you're gonna save is, is just gonna offset all these extra costs that you're going to incur. And then you factor in the headaches of working in all these different states. Um, it's just, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're new to locum tenants and you don't have an S Corporation set up yet, just do yourself a favor. Don't do it. We have clients who come in every once in a while and they do have a corporation set up and anybody who works in multiple states isn't doing what they're supposed to do. 
Um, they, the lawyers sometimes want you to do it because they talk about um, liability protection. Setting up a corporation doesn't protect against malpractice. Malpractice insurance and, and, an, and an adequate umbrella policy protects against malpractice. So before you go and jump into an S corporation for, for doing your locums, um, I don't know, I would, I would think long and hard about it. And I think just setting up an LLC, a limited liability company, a professional limited liability company, a PLLC, um, getting the adequate insurances in place, I think that is, is the way to go. You're gonna have a lot less headaches. You're gonna be a lot happier. Um, and if for some reason this QBI deduction stays in place, the QBI deduction is um, sole proprietors do better with the QBI deduction than S corporations. So I hope I made that point uh, pretty clear. Um, but I just, it's, it's, it's a, the S corps, oh, sometimes they come in, it's such a mess. Oh, and it, 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 you can't even fix it. It's such a mess. Okay. Okay, planning trips. Okay, so um, the taxes you owe, they're going to feel high because nothing's being withheld. But if you plan ahead, it's manageable. First of all, there's the 40% rule. And basically, we recommend that our clients who get paid as 1099 contractors, they set aside 40% of what they earn for taxes, and they put 60% in the household account to spend. If you put aside 40%, you should be in fine shape with your taxes and also have money left over to put away for retirement. I do the quarterly estimates. Um, if you don't, if you fall behind with your quarterly estimates and you owe a lot of money on your taxes, um, remember I, I briefly went over when the estimated taxes are due, but we have some clients that on April 15th, they owe a lot of taxes for their prior year's return, right? Because that's when, when taxes are due. They owe their first quarter estimate on April 15th and they owe their second quarter estimate on June 15th. So we have clients who are, who are, who are basically paying a year's worth of taxes or almost a year's worth of taxes in within two months, it's brutal. So pay estimates, track your expenses. Um, we have a spreadsheet on our website. I think um, Barton has one on their website too. You wanna to keep good records. Um, the best way to do it is to keep a set of books using either QuickBooks Online. There's a, there's a simple version for like 15 bucks a month or use Mint, which is a, Intuit owns that too. It's a, it's a free version of a, um, it just keeps, you just download your banking transactions and your credit card transactions. And um, if you, you've got to categorize everything, it learns what you do. And, it, and it, 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 you can generate a report at the end of the year showing all your expenses. Use a separate credit card. Keep track of your receipts. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but you definitely want to commit to one of those. If not, there's no way you're going to remember all the money you spent. So you want to keep good records. Um, take advantage of, of the tax shelters available to people in your situation. And that's the retirement accounts. Uh, health savings accounts, both of those work out pretty great. And um, uh, and then, yeah, this stuff's it's hard. Actually, well, it is hard, but the, the tax rules, <laughs> they are hard. But there are also the rules are specific and it's a matter, most people besides people who do accounting all the time, just like what you guys do, never really have the time to learn it. Somebody who's who really wants to learn about this stuff can learn about it, but most people don't have the time or the desire to learn all the nuances of tax. It's just like you guys are so valuable with everything you do because you've, you've spent the time to learn it and become experts at it. So I can sell the tax professional. Um, if you can find someone who specializes, that's good. Um, the medical and dental and, 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 and that stuff, it's not overly complicated, but there's things to know. And if you work with, if you go to a tax person who works with a lot of other physicians and, and psychologists and dentists, they, they might you might get a little bit of information um, that you wouldn't get by going to a generalist. I'm not a big fan of, of generalists um, in the accounting world. Um, and there's, there's plenty of specialists out there. Okay, so I hope I didn't talk too quick, uh, but I probably did. Uh, we went through a lot of very important information for people in your situation. Um, and uh, there's, as I put on the other slide, this all can be managed. Uh, you, you, dedicating a little bit of time um, every, every week, every month to just your, your books and, and learning one or two little things, uh, yeah, you'll do great. And, uh, I, I think it would be really interesting to do what you do. I don't know if they have it in accounting where you get to go to different places for different lengths of time and meet different people and live in different cities and help out different organizations. I really think, um, what, what that, that opportunity is special and, uh, uh for however long 
you you guys are doing it. I just think that's that's great. Um, so make some money, set aside some in these tax deferred accounts, and pay your taxes and enjoy enjoy the ride. So do you want to see if there's questions up here? Hey Andrew, um, that was great. Thank you. I've been trying to write them all down and kind of put them together in a cohesive thing to make it easier. Um, I guess the first question I had, which is a pretty easy one, um, do you take out-of-state clients? So do you only work local or do you take locum tenants from around the country? Um, we do. If you set up as a corporation, we wouldn't. Um, besides the New England states, uh, there's, there's, there's local rules that, mm -hmm. that make it too tough. And um, But otherwise, most of the states we take on um, Pennsylvania makes it too hard. They have a local income tax. Um, what else? What's the other one? It's, oh, Ohio has a local income tax. It's too hard. We spend more time doing these little local tax forms than helping mm -hmm. people do the federal and state taxes. And California is, they don't want anybody from outside the state doing anything. They, California, they charge onerous taxes. I mean, penalties, there's no way to get them waived. And you want to work with somebody who does California stuff all the time if you're located in California. But otherwise, uh, yeah, we do. And um, depending on what, what business you have, we have a few different options. One is to just do your personal tax return every year. Uh, we do send out some customized information. We send out um, a lot of generic information. It's all available on our website too. Uh -huh. uh, and we help people with their estimates and we send estimate reminders. We, we, we try to help them. If somebody has a business, there's, there's, some, there's options where we're a little bit more involved. But, um, yeah, okay. Very, so more. people that are, you know, in Illinois or Maryland, or um, they can go to your website and see if, um, you know, go to your website and yeah. see if you can. Okay, great. Um, yeah. A couple more questions. And any of these questions that are not answered, everyone, I will put them in an email, send them to Andrew, and I will, um, we'll make sure that the questions are answered in the follow up email. Um, another couple of questions about deductions. Um, yeah. I know that you mentioned, um, that you can write off certain things um, for health insurance. So let's say that you did have health insurance for three quarters of the year, but you didn't have them for three months. Can you write off those three months? And then also, can you also write off the dental and vision or just health? Yeah, I think the health insurance is any month you don't have insurance through some other source, you can write it off as, uh, as your self-employed health insurance. Okay. Um, that counts. Um, yeah. And dental and vision are included when you say health? Yeah, dental and vision are included. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, this question: the hundred percent meals. Sorry. Oh yeah, and there's more about meals too. So let's say that you're out and about, um, and you have all of your receipts. Um, can you, in theory, deduct more with the receipts, or is you know the seventy one dollars for Massachusetts is that just if you don't have your receipts? Oh, that's that's specific by um by trip. Okay. So um so the the whole time you're at your locums assignment. Mm -hmm. You either do the daily rate or you do actual, um, uh, or you base it on receipts. Okay. Um, but the longer you're there, the better off you're going to be doing, do, but to, to base it on the actual receipts, you know? Gotcha. Yep. Um, but, if, but if you go to a conference and you're at a conference for three days and you, and you really uh, treat yourself special and you would base that on the actual receipts. But if you go somewhere for two months, you're just going to do the, the, whatever the daily rate is for that, for that town, that city. Okay. And let's say I have a couple about actual specific cars. So like, um, can you write off, you know, car repairs or maintenance if you're using them to travel back and forth for a locum assignment and, or let's say you buy an RV or something like that. Can you write that off? Okay. The RV. Okay. So, um, where's my car page? Okay. So automobile expenses, um, yeah. Commuting to a, between your home and a temporary job site, a place where you're going to work for, for a year or less that's deductible. Um, you either do it based on 57 and a half cents a mile, or you do it based on actual expenses incurred. And the actual expenses incurred includes um, repairs. So you can't do standard mileage and then add the repairs. Um, it's either 57 and a half cents a mile or, or, or just the actual expenses. The more miles you drive, the more attractive the standard mileage rate is because it's not that expensive to maintain your car. There is a special deal with um, cars with a gross vehicle weight in excess of um, 6,000 pounds. And um, so the depreciation, if you buy one of those big SUVs, you get to get, you get, to get a bigger write-off up front if you drive it more than 50% for business. The RV, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that. I know that the, <laughs> the government, they do hate seeing boats, but if you have an RV, I don't, I, I don't know. It'll be kind of like your home. I don't know. 
Really yeah. If you live out of it, technically it could be your home. If you're not getting reimbursed for a home, I, I guess so. your tax accountant could work on getting that pushed through for you. Right. Yeah. It's not, it's, I don't know. I don't think I have any clients who have an RV, so I never had to look it up. Probably know. not that popular in Massachusetts. <laughs> Can't go down Starrow Drive. I don't know if you're in Massachusetts. We have a road that the bridges are like um, 10 feet high. So, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, no, yeah, it's crazy. Um, oh, yeah, you're there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, totally. Um, let's see. Um, I did have a bunch of questions come in about telemedicine. So let's say that you um, are doing telemedicine and you live in, let's say, Florida, and you don't have any state income tax. Um, but you are doing services in different states. Technically, how do, where do you pay your state income tax? Oh, and how does that work? You're doing telemedicine, it's, it's based on where you're doing the telemedicine. So it's not where the customer is. It's where you are. So okay. if you're working from your house doing telemedicine and you're in Florida, there's no state income taxes. Even if you get a 1099 that says like you got the income is uh, Georgia income, it's mm-hmm. not. Um, uh, it's no, it's it's based on where you, where you are physically where you physically are located. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I think that answers a bunch of those questions. Um, let's see. Um, I did have a bunch of co- questions about Cobra and how is Cobra considered? What if you have Cobra? Is that, I don't know exactly how it was worded. Yeah. So we count about? Cobra. So if somebody has Cobra, we count it as a self-employed health insurance. If you read the, the rules, if you go to the IRS publication, it kind of implies that it's not, but, but my, the way I look at it is usually you get better insurance for, for a better premium. If you have Cobra. So it's, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a business decision to stick with COBRA versus trying to get a better policy as an individual. So we take it. We, we, we deduct it for people. I, you know, we've never had a question. Okay. Um, let me see. There were a bunch of questions about 401ks, Roth IRAs, and um, based on ages, could you, I know we have one minute left, but um, if you could send me some information about specific age limits, I can make sure that we include those links specifically in the follow-up email, because there's a lot of questions about age restrictions and when you can, um, uh, I guess, open IRA accounts and stuff like that. Okay, well, they, they changed those IRA accounts where before you can only open it to the year until you turn 70 and a half. They, they did away with that rule. So any year that you have earned income, you and your spouse can both put away uh, 6,000 if you're under 50 or 7,000 each if you're over 50, as long as you have that much earned income. Um, I actually have, uh, we can talk about this offline, but I, I, I have a, a presentation, a similar length that is on all these tax advantage accounts. Maybe we can work that into the schedule um, yeah. later on. But yeah. Um, yeah, you want to, uh, IRAs are fine. Whether or not an IRA is tax deductible depends on um, whether, how much income you have and whether you, you are contributing to another retirement plan during the year. Roth IRAs are great if you're contributing to a, a retirement plan because you're not going to get a tax deduction on your IRA anyways, but there's income limitations for that. Um, yeah, maybe we can find a time to, to, to for, for that um, presentation. But, yeah, uh, I think that's great. Um, and just to let everyone know this, um, we will be editing the recording just a little bit because there were some, we were, Andrew and I were uh, chatting earlier at the beginning of it. So we will, um, we'll edit this and then we'll send it out to all of you. Um, we'll also send out this presentation if that's okay with you, Andrew, because um, a lot of people have been asking about the hyperlinks and they want to click on them and they're very eager to get all this information. Um, and then I will share some of the stuff that you talked about on your website as well. So it's easier for them to find. Okay. Can I follow up on one question um, that this person asked about sure. retired dentists who want to do locum tenants jobs? So we talked about this earlier. Um, I actually think that's a great opportunity because mm-hmm. we have a lot of clients and every once in a while, they, they, they find themselves in a situation either with a maternity leave or, or they lose an associate very quickly and they need to, to have somebody come in for a couple months while, while they figure out what they're going to do. Um, I actually think that's a, that's a huge opportunity for somebody who wants to travel around and 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 go and work at somebody's office um, and, and help them out for a couple of months and go to a different different city and live and you know dentistry for the most part it's very pleasant work uh, and if you're a retired dentist thinking about doing that uh, Barton does does offer that and um, I just think that'd be a win win that that sounds great I mean, we're gonna start promoting it um, right I never asked I just assumed that it was only medical but uh, we have. I, I know two or three clients right now who, who are struggling with, with something happened where they need to get somebody in for a couple of months. So um, I'm going to follow up on that. But I did, I did want to follow up on that. I saw that question. 
Yep. Um, and could you scroll back to the, um, the end of your presentation that has your actual oh. web address on it? Yes. Uh, whoops. I go. Oh no. <laughs> Here go. Oh, that's me. I don't know. It's uh, we'll go to the top, I guess. Is it at the top? No, that'd be too easy. Yeah. Uh, it's right here. It's Schwartz, it was schwartzaccountants.com. Yeah. Schwartz accountants with an S. We couldn't get a longer one. That was it. Um, yeah. S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z accountants.com for those on the phone. Yeah. Great. Right. I hope I answered as many questions as possible. I know that you guys were having, um, a lot of them were coming in. Um, in the follow-up email that we send out, we will have a link for you guys to get in touch with Andrew if you would like to use his services. Um, and then it'll, there'll be tons of information in the email, probably too much information. Um, if you guys have any further questions, feel free to respond back to the email that um, had the link to this webinar and they'll come right to me and I can try to answer um, any of your questions or send them over to Andrew. Okay, great. Well, well, thank you. Thanks for your time, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Andrew. Have a great weekend. Thanks. Bye. Bye.